How, how many of you are studying education? Raise your hand if you're studying education. Okay, a few of you. Uh, how many of you are, how many of you have taken any classes related to issues like racism, sexism, anything like that? Have you taken any classes at any point? Okay. So what I would like to talk with you about uh, is based on my experience the last 20 years or so working with educational institutions all over the US and many different countries that is partially about the, the barriers to progress around racial equity. Now, I do a lot of work in schools and universities, colleges. If I walk into any of these educational institutions and I go to the person who has the most power in that institution and I ask that person, do you care about racism and racial equity and racial justice, what do you think they say? Yes. Of course I do. So there, there's no lack of people who say they're committed to it or lack of institutions that say they're committed to it. In fact, every institution I've ever worked in has something in their mission or vision statement about how important equity and justice is. The problem is, then if I look at what they're actually doing, if I say, well, what are you doing in service to that commitment to racial justice or economic justice or whatever it is, that's where things get tricky. That's where I hear things like, well, we had the International Food Fair last week and the Multicultural Arts and Crafts Show is coming up and everything other than actual things that, have, that create less racism and more racial justice. So what I've been working on is developing a way of thinking about this that puts at the center of the conversation a commitment to racial justice. Not, you know, part of the problem, of course, is what's rewarded in higher ed and in K-12 education is not actual racial justice. What's rewarded is the illusion of racial justice. What's awarded is the optics of racial justice, not actual racial justice. So, and a lot of the popular frameworks and models that people have used historically to work on these issues might actually contribute to the problem. How many of you have ever heard the term uh, inclusive excellence? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that term. Okay, this is what I'm talking about. It's like somebody decided to take the two vaguest terms in the entire education lexicon and just squish them together into this term inclusive excellence to make sure nobody knows what in the hell they're talking about. Right? And, and this is the sort of thing, these, these sort of detours around. So what I'm gonna do is uh, take you through, hopefully challenging you to think about this stuff in a way that maximizes the transformative potential of how we're thinking about uh, racial justice in and out of education. We're gonna warm up though with a quiz here. Uh, there's no particular reason you're gonna know any of the data or statistics to any of the answers on any of these questions, which is another way of saying I have equally low expectations of all of you gathered here today. But this is just, this is just about warming up those equity muscles. So let's see how you all do. So here's the first question. The fastest rate of poverty growth in the United States is happening in which kinds of communities? How many of you think the fastest rate of poverty growth is happening in urban areas? Raise your hand if you would say urban areas has the fastest rate. So you see, you put your hand up for like a second, then you looked around and put your hand down. Okay, so a couple people will say that. How many of you would say suburban areas have the fastest rate of poverty growth? How many of you would say rural areas have the fastest rate? Uh, rural areas have the highest rates of poverty, but suburban areas have the fastest rates of poverty growth. I, I always want to take rural areas off the quiz because I cannot pronounce the word rural. <laughs> rural. I don't know. Everyone say rural. Rural. Yeah, you can't pronounce it either. So at some point, <laughs> we need a different word for that. According to a national study of U.S. parents, 66% of parents from families not experiencing poverty reported they always checked to ensure their children did their homework. What percentage of parents from families that are experiencing poverty report they always check to ensure their children did their homework? 
Raise your hand if you think it's 42%. Raise your hand if you think it's 72%. Raise your hand if you think it's 92%. Correct answer is 72%. Now, a lot of people pick 42% for this. And to me, a big, one of the biggest challenges with equity work and education is that people think of it as very practical. Like we just have to apply what is the next shiny thing. We're just gonna apply that. We're gonna apply this model, this program, this student extracurricular thing. But really a big part of the issue is ideological. A big challenge is ideological, ideological. And this is a good example of that where I might presume based on stereotypes common stereotype that certain groups of parents don't value education the way other groups of parents have. So if I buy into that stereotype, I might, uh, I might take a question like this and interpret it in a way that is based on that stereotype. And if I'm doing that, I really have no shot at creating more equity. So one of the messages we're gonna be talking about throughout this next 40 minutes or so is that the shift can't just be practical. The shift's got to be ideological. Practice is driven by ideology. So we'll talk more about that. Who said this? We have deluded ourselves into believing the myth that capitalism grew and prospered out of the Protestant ethic of hard work and sacrifices. Capitalism was built on the exploitation of black slaves and continues to thrive on the exploitation of the poor, both black and white, both here and abroad. Who thinks Bernie Sanders said that? Raise your hand if you would say Bernie Sanders said that. Raise your hand if you think Eleanor Roosevelt said that. Raise your hand if you think Martin Luther King Jr. said that. All right, like half of you have stopped playing, so I'm gonna start over <laughs> and you're gonna pick one. Everyone's gotta pick one. Or pick all three, I won't even notice, but you have to pick at least one. So how many of you think Bernie Sanders said that? How many of you think Eleanor Roosevelt said that? How many of you think Martin Luther King Jr. said that? Okay, that was actually Martin Luther King Jr. Now, let me ask you a question. If I walk into any school in the state of Illinois, preschool through 12th grade, any school in the state of Illinois, and I find the Martin Luther King Jr. poster, because, you know, it is February after all, so the poster will be up for one month. But if I find the Martin Luther King Jr. poster, what is that poster going to say on it? That's a lie about who Martin Luther King Jr. was. Do you all know that? That is a lie about who Martin Luther King Jr. was. Why do we lie? Why have we taken the fluffiest, most depoliticized thing Martin Luther King Jr. ever said or wrote and made that the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr.? Why, why does that happen? Why do educational safe. institutions do that? It's safe. Yes. Yeah, so it's safe for whom, right? Yeah, so, uh, and this I think is a really good sort of snapshot of what often happens with racial equity or racial justice work in educational institutions, is that it's done in a way to be safe to white people. How can we create the illusion we're moving forward without making white people feel uncomfortable? It's almost like we wanna take the discomfort and the oppression that people of color experience, and we're worried that we might offload a little bit of that onto white people. Uh, that's so classic. So if there is any equity work happening, it's usually happening at the pace of the people who are the least interested in progress around that. And, and we got to do the inverse of that, which is move at the pace of the people who are the most interested uh, in it. All right, here's the last question. Raise your hand if you have answered all the questions correctly so far. Okay. Well, we've got, we have a couple people who have. The three wealthiest people in the world have as much wealth as. Who thinks the three wealthiest people have as much wealth as the eight poorest countries? Raise your hand. How many of you would say the 48 poorest countries? How many of you would say the 308 poorest countries? Correct answer is the 48 poorest countries. Now, if you chose the 308 poorest countries, I hope you do not study or teach geography. Because there are 196 countries. People wonder what's wrong with education in the United States. I think we've just identified it. Okay, there's no particular reason why you know any of the answers to these questions. We're just warming up 
those equity literacy muscles. So if we're going to talk about racial equity and racial justice, here's the common thing. A lot of organizations that do this work in schools, basically the process is you bring me in, then we're going to spend about a couple years doing some community dialogues, doing some town hall meetings, doing some personal awareness stuff, and maybe in the third year we'll get around to talking about the question we should start the conversation with, which is how is racism operating here right now? And so I think about a question like this. How is racism operating at your university right now? Can you, could you name five ways right now racism is operating here? And, and, and this is the challenge. Usually people experiencing the racism can name those things. Here are the ways racism is operating. Uh, and I think sometimes, especially for white people, there's this tendency to want to jump over this question and just go to solutions. I don't want to have to talk about it. Let's just talk about what we're going to do about it. The, the problem is, if I can't answer that question, if you can't answer that question about your institution, you can't fight racism at that institution. You have to be able to answer this question first. So this is the first question we should be asking. How's racism operating here? How's heterosexism or ableism or transphobia? How is it operating here? How is sexism operating here right now? As we sit in this room, how is it operating right now across this campus? That's got to be the first question, the central question that stays at the center of the conversation. I think one of the challenges is, and I'll talk about some ways that this happens, is that there's a tendency to want to detour away from that. So instead of talking about how is racism operating, let's talk about how we can get along better with each other. Let's talk about how we can celebrate diversity better. Let's talk about what we can learn about each other's cultures better. It's not that any of those things aren't important, but none of those things is a threat to racism. And so if we're talking about creating a, an institution that's racially equitable, that's got to be the uh, center question. We'll talk more about that in a second. Now, I want to share a few stories with you about the birth of the, the sort of approach that I use. I call it equity literacy. How do we strengthen our literacy when it comes to matters of equity and justice? And a, a lot of the work I do is in schools, so these stories actually come out of schools that I've uh, worked with. So the, the first one is, I was doing some, uh, what's called like an equity and justice assessment at a school in the northeastern part of the US. And uh, in order to do that, I was doing focus groups, or my organization was doing focus groups. So we started with a focus group of African American students, and we asked them, well, what is, what's the school like for you? How, how are you experiencing this school? And I can remember the very first student responded by saying, I feel like a visitor at my own school. Uh, that's what first feedback we heard. Second person said, I feel hyper visible, but I also feel invisible. So whenever I'm sitting in class and something about slavery comes up and everyone looks at me and I'm expected to speak for my entire group, I feel hyper visible. The rest of the time I feel pretty invisible. So we're hearing things like that. At the very end of the focus group, a young woman slammed her fist on the table and she said, there's racism at this school and nobody's doing anything about it. I want you to think about how the people with the least amount of power in that institution were characterizing what the problem is. They weren't saying people aren't celebrating us enough. They were saying we're experiencing racism here and nobody's doing anything about it. All right, so, we, uh, so after that focus group, we do a focus group with the upper level administrators at the same school and we ask them, well, what do you think's going on here around race and around equity and justice? And uh, I remember the principal, principal was like a middle-aged white guy, former diplomat. He was wearing this diversity tie right here. And it was, so we're thinking, well, he probably wants that in the assessment report, right? Like, what's going well at the school? The principal wears a diversity tie. If that's on your list of what's going well at your institution when it comes to race, you got some problems. So, so we ask this question, the principal's wearing this diversity tie and he leans back in his chair and he says, what we need to do here is celebrate the joys of diversity. And so I said, that's your gap. So what do you mean that's my gap? I said, well, I just came from a focus group of African-American students and what they're saying 
is they're experiencing racism at your school and you aren't doing anything about it. And what was interesting is the people with the most power at the school, that had never even occurred to them to think of it through that lens. They're like, we need more, you know, we need more multicultural arts and crafts fairs. We need more, you know, celebratory stuff. That's an ideological block. There were no practical programs that were gonna move that school forward because the block there was ideological. The people with the most power, they weren't even thinking through that lens. How is racism operating here right now? Okay, so that was the first story. The second story, the most brilliant analysis around equity and justice I ever hear is from usually middle school and high school students. Just brilliant, spot on analysis. So I was uh, doing a workshop at a middle school for some teachers and during a break, I was talking with a group of middle school students, and their school the next day was going to do this thing they called Diverse Friends Day. So I, I, I'm already suspicious of the thing. But so Diverse Friends Day. So I said, well, what's Diverse Friends Day? And if any of you have ever heard of Mix It Up at Lunch Day, that's basically what it is. So Diverse Friends Day is basically we're going to kind of force integrate the cafeteria for a day. So we're gonna force students to sit with students they wouldn't normally sit with during lunch. And although race wasn't explicitly named, that's the implication. We're gonna racially integrate the cafeteria. So I'm talking with these uh, three students of color and I'm asking them, well, what do you think about the Diverse Friends Day thing tomorrow? You know, so um, one of the students said, eh, I, I don't really care. Another student said, well, they're forcing us to sit with the kids who call us names. Mm -hmm. That was the second one. The third student, and now this is maybe the most brilliant analysis I've ever heard on any of these issues. The third student said, I think Diverse Friends Day is for white students. So well, let's talk about it. What do you mean it's for white students? And in essence, what the students were saying was, you know, as an, this particular student was African American, as an African American student in this school, I really don't need to hang out with white kids to learn about how race is operating. Like, I'm dodging that all the time. So this idea that, you know, so who is this really for? Who is this for? Who is this designed for? Was it designed for the students of color or was it designed for like gentle diversity, not anti-racism education, but gentle diversity awareness for white students. And then what is the role of the students of color in that process? Are they just props for the learning of the white students? Are they sort of, I'm gonna gently, you know, I will share Salisbury steak with you. I don't know what they eat in school lunch cafeterias now, but it seemed like every day was Salisbury steak when I was in school. So we're gonna eat some crappy lunch together and uh, actually, I liked Salisbury steak. Why did I just call it crappy? I don't know. Why am I talking to myself now? It's confusing. Uh, so I think Mix It Up at Lunch is for white people, or I think Diverse Friends Day is for white people. I was like, yeah. And if you look at all of the celebrating diversity stuff that goes on in educational institutions, and even a lot of the education stuff around race, and you ask yourself, well, who is this really for? Whose pace are we moving at here? You know, we got students of color who are experiencing racism in the school, and we have adults who are saying, maybe the solution to that racism is to force students of color to sit with white students during lunch. You see the breakdown there? That, again, that's an ideological misunderstanding. Uh, the third story comes from, uh, I worked at this university called Hamlin University in St. Paul. And I was leaving the university, and the provost wanted to talk to me before I went to my, a different job. And the provost said, you know, I really appreciate in your five years here all the work you've done around equity and diversity, and it's been great. And, and uh, he said, you know, I, I just want to ask you before you leave, I know we have a lot of work to do, but what is one thing you would prioritize? What is one thing that you would say, you really need to work on this, you need to prioritize this over other things? And I had noticed going to the provost's office that if I had any kind of mobility-related disability, I would not have been able to get to his office. It's a private university, so this, I, I guess they get away with having this really old building that is not, has not been adjusted for accommodations. So, uh, you know, I wanna say, well, the racism and the sexism and the heterosexism and all that, but, uh, but then I think, you know, there are some students 
because the campus is not accessible. They can't even get on campus long enough to experience the racism and sexism because the campus is not accessible to them. So I say to him, I say, I think the first thing you need to do is make the campus accessible to, to all people, that it's ridiculous that the administrative building is not accessible. So the provost thinks for a minute and he says, you know, I, I get where you're coming from, but I can't think of one student on this whole campus that uses a wheelchair. Uh, now think about the lens that he's looking through. And I'm thinking, well, let's, I wonder why there are no <laughs> students on here, you know. But, but again, that was a mindset thing. He wasn't lacking for good intentions. He, well, he, didn't, he, he wasn't uncaring, but he, he just couldn't recognize the injustices that were right in front of him. He just couldn't recognize it or chose not to recognize it. So that's, I think, a, a lot of the shift. So I want to talk about uh, maybe a little different way of looking at it. So I think it starts just by talking about, I keep using the word equity. So what the heck do I mean? when I talk about equity. So I think of inequity as an unjust distribution of access and opportunity. How is access and opportunity distributed? But I think about that both in terms of material access and non-material access. So really quickly, what are examples here? What are examples of types of material resources, things that cost money, that some students here have access to and other students don't? But if I have access to that stuff, I'm going to be at an advantage here. What would be an example of that? Tutoring. Tutoring's a great example. What else? AP courses. Okay. If I had AP courses, what else? Laptop. Laptop, technology. Anything else? Like opportunities for extracurricular uh, being able to afford when I was in P12 to have extracurricular, but even here, think, how many of you during your college, because some of you are in college now, some of you previously, obviously, but raise your hand if now or when you were in college, raise your hand if you have to work at least half time just to be able to afford to your tuition. Raise your hand if you're like that. Okay. So think about that. Those of you who didn't have to do that, think about the luxury of that, of not having to do that. Think about, and, and it's not just, well, this is going to make classes easier. This is going to make, give me more time to develop relationships with faculty that might later write a recommendation for me to get a job or to get into grad school or, or something like that. Right? So how is access and opportunity distributed? There are also things that I, would, that I think of as non-material resources. So they don't cost money, but they're more about institutional culture. They're more about institutional policies and practices. How many of you ever, if you had to work, how many of you ever had difficulty being able to take a class you needed for, for your degree because it was never scheduled in a time that was convenient for your work schedule? Raise your hand if you ever experienced that. So again, if you're thinking, I've never experienced that, think about the luxury of never having to experience that. Right? Who is the day scheduled for? You know, who are classes really scheduled for? But also things about you know, who has access to faculty who look like them or who understands their life experience? Who has access to a curriculum where they're not invisible? Who has, so it's more about that. Who has access to institutional policies and practices that don't constantly punish them or leave them out of learning opportunities because of their socioeconomic status or, or whatever it is, okay? How many of you uh, can think of anything at this university that you've wanted to participate in, whether it's like studying overseas or whatever it is, anything you've wanted to participate in but couldn't participate in it because you couldn't afford to participate in it? Anybody ever had that experience? Think about, I mean, here's the reality. At a public university, that should never happen. Nobody should have the experience. Well, that person can buy their way into more learning opportunity here than this other student. The reality is that should never happen at a public institution, but that happens in K-12, and it happens in higher ed, and, and everywhere else. So, uh, the, the non-material stuff, that stuff around institutional culture, 
You know, for some people, it's harder to wrap my arms around that, but I have to understand that. And really, it gets down to who is this institution built for? Maybe it accommodates some other people, but really, who is it built for? Right? Who's being privileged through policies and practices? So equity, then, is about redistributing access and opportunity so it's distributed more justly. That doesn't mean students show up to campus and we confiscate their belongings and then redistribute their belongings. It means we look at policies, we look at practices. How is access and opportunity being distributed? I knew of students at George Mason University where I taught there who dropped out of certain majors because they couldn't afford the textbooks that, that professors were assigning in those majors. Uh, you know, engineering textbooks that cost $280. Right? If you're assigning a textbook like that, you are being unjust. If you don't have a policy against assigning textbooks like that, you are being unjust. That's the sort of thing that we need to look at. There should never be a student who's priced out of a major because faculty are too equity dense to think about, oh, I better think about how much this costs. Even textbooks that cost 70 or $80 are a hardship to a lot of students. Right, but we don't think about that. So then again, I have to ask, well, who is that engineering class for? Who is it for? Right, that, those are the questions we have to grapple with. So equity is the process of redistributing, challenge, changing policies, changing practices, looking at how racism is operating, eliminating the racism, looking at how economic injustice or ableism or whatever else is operating, eliminate uh, that. So then I, so based on that definition of equity, I have this notion that, that my colleague Katie Swalwell and I call equity literacy or equity or justice literacy. We, we base it around two questions. The first one is, what are the knowledge and skills I need to be a threat to the existence of inequity in my spheres of influence? What are the knowledge and skills I need so when I walk onto this campus or I walk into this classroom or this school or this, this building where my job is, my presence there is a threat to racism because I know how to recognize it in all its subtle forms and I know how to do something about it and I'm willing to do something about it. What are the knowledge and skills I need to be able to do that? Not just celebrating diversity, not just cultural competence, but I can recognize, hey, that policy or that practice is racist, so we need to address that as a racist policy or practice. And then this concept of spheres of influence, I think, is really important because I think for some people, it seems really big. It's like, oh, well, I have to stop being, you know, a second grade teacher and instead eliminate global racism. But, but you know, a classroom itself is a system. So, you know, I tell teachers, even if your individual classroom is your sphere of influence, that's a perfectly reasonable sphere of influence. So the question then is, how do you identify and eliminate racism from that sphere, from your classroom? Then maybe it's your school, then maybe it's your school district, then maybe it's the wider community and you're broadening out uh, from there. The second question is, do I have the will? Do I have the will to be that threat? Because I know people who have the knowledge and skills. There's a lot of people who go through college and pick up the knowledge and skills, but who in the end don't have the will to do it. Maybe I'm hung up on not being liked or whatever. Now, one thing I want to clarify about the will is in some ways easy for me as a white man to stand up here and talk about the will. Because one thing that I know for sure is that there are things I'm saying up here that if a person of color was saying exactly what I'm saying, they would be heard quite differently by, uh, you know, by a, a lot of people. So I recognize it's kind of easy that I have this sort of layer of protection uh, about, uh, about the will. But the question is, it can't just be about now I understand. It's gotta be about now what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? So the knowledge, the skills, and the will. And I'm just gonna go back just to the kind of nomenclature that we often use for this stuff. I don't know how many of you have a background in K-12 education but a lot of the most common frameworks that people use to talk about this stuff are built around very sort of vague cultural frameworks. Now, there are some of these like culturally responsive, cultural relevance, 
that actually have racial justice built into them, but they're often implemented without the racial justice, so then it ends up just looking like kind of cultural competence. Uh, a lot of this stuff, there's actually research about cultural competence. Uh, one group did a study where they looked, uh, they were from the medical education world, so they looked at medical education schools that use cultural competence as their base framework for talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And what, so they studied the materials and the workshops at these institutions, and what they found, they looked at 40 different institutions, and what they found was that out of those 40, only three of them ever mentioned racism in all of their work. And so some, in some ways, these can kind of be a detour around that. The one that I find most confounding, how many of you have ever heard of this, culturally and linguistically diverse? Is that language familiar to anybody? I mean, this is where, this is like, this is like uh, kind of similar to inclusive excellence. Because when I look at this, the thing I think is, this doesn't mean anything. Everybody's culturally and linguistically diverse. So, so I don't really understand what we're naming here. If we're talking about students who are culturally and linguistically marginalized, students who are experiencing racism, we have to name what we're talking about. Because if we name it as, well, we have culturally and linguistically diverse children, that's not necessarily going to land us at a solution of eliminate the racism. It's more likely to land us at a solution of we need to appreciate the diversity. And that's not a solution to racism. So that's, those, again, are sort of the shifts that we're working with schools and school districts uh, to make. So this is our kind of social justice arithmetic. If you start with racism and you add some celebrating diversity, maybe an anti-bullying program, some grit, and some community dialogues, you still land on racism because none of this has identified or eliminated the racism. Maybe it's helped prepare us to identify and eliminate the racism, but nothing here has identified racist policies or practices and then eliminated those policies or practices. Doesn't mean that any of this stuff isn't important. I do know in the K-12 world, anti-bullying programs tend to be, uh, actually research on, how, how many of you in your uh, K-12 school experience went to a school where they did any kind of anti-bullying stuff? Whether it was like an assembly or anything, okay. What research is showing about those anti-bullying programs is that bullying usually increases following those programs. This one group was studying these anti-bullying assemblies and what they were finding was kids are being bullied in the audience while they're watching the assembly. That that's actually going, uh, going up. So pretty interesting uh, stuff there. So we gotta do something more. So we think about equity literacy as revolving around four what we call sort of critical abilities. The first one is just the ability to recognize inequity. Would you know if it, would you recognize it if it was right in front of you? And part of the challenge is most people are really good at recognizing the kinds of bias and inequity and injustice they experience. Maybe not so good at identifying the kinds if we're on the privilege end of that privilege oppression continuum. So we're gonna talk about some examples of recognizing inequity in a second. The second is the ability to respond. In the moment someone uses a racist term or someone talks about a, a practice or a policy that you know is racist or sexist or whatever, in the moment do you know how to respond to it? So that's sort of the reactive. In the moment it comes up, do I know how to respond? But that's not even enough. We have to know how to redress. Redress requires us to take a step back and look at sort of the whole network, the whole web of inequity and injustice, and then address it at its roots instead of just addressing it as things pop up, like the whole whack-a-mole kind of approach to it. Right? And this requires us, let's say we've identified some way racism is operating in the institution. This requires us to take a step back and not just fix that thing, but also ask ourselves, well, what is it about institutional culture that allowed that racism to operate on campus to begin with? Why did it take us 40 years to change this policy or practice? What is it about the racism of the institution that protects those kinds of policies and practices? So that's a bigger 
uh, undertaken, and then the ability to sustain progress as we move forward. A lot of what I see is we make a little bit of progress, there's a little bit of resistance, so we roll back the progress, and we make a little more progress, roll back the progress, that sort of thing. So let's talk really quickly about recognize. Now, there's, uh, there's this research about, this is based in high schools, there's this research about, uh, I'm sorry, this first example is a K-12 example, the second one is just in high schools. So there's this research about how educators tend to treat students differently based on perceived gender or gender identity. And uh, so let's see, I, I'm sure you all will know this. What it finds is that on average, K-12 teachers, uh, for instance, an example of this research is it shows that teachers tend to call on boys or call on students are interpreting as boys more than they call on students are interpreting as girls, things like that. But there's this other research about how teachers complement students differently based on gender or perceived gender. And what that finds is uh, when a K-12 teacher compliments a boy, a young man, a student that teacher's at least interpreting to be a boy or a young man, they're most likely to compliment him about what? What do you think? Capacity or effort, anyone else have a guess? Character. Character. Intelligence. Intelligence, that's uh, intelligence or ability. So the most common compliment boys or young men uh, are hearing from their teachers is about how smart they are, how capable they are, that sort of thing. What about students who, uh, girls or young women, or students teachers are interpreting as girls or young women? What do you think the most common compliment they hear is? Uh, kind, polite, nice. They look nice. That's it. They look nice. So the most common compliment young men or boys are getting is, you're really good at science, you're an awesome writer. The most common compliment girls or young women are getting from their K-12 teachers, well, gosh, your hair looks pretty today. That's a, that's a nice, that's a lovely, I was gonna say blouse. Do people still use the word blouse? That's a, I like, that's a nice blouse you're wearing. Uh, oh, those are, those are really pretty shoes. That's the most common kind of compliment girls or young women are hearing from K-12 teachers. Okay. So how many of you ever spent time as a student in a K-12 school? Raise your hand. Okay, just trying to make sure you're paying attention. How many of you ever noticed that before? Now be honest. If you've ever, if that has ever jumped out at you as a pattern, raise your hand if you've ever noticed that. Okay, a few of you. So this is what I'm talking about. If I, if I don't notice it, I can't address it as an equity issue. So we gotta actually practice noticing, we gotta, especially if we're in dominant identity groups. I gotta practice recognizing how inequities uh, operate. You know, I, I was walking into this high school in Wisconsin, and there was this, uh, there was a uh, yard sign in the grass, and the yard sign, this was last spring, and the yard sign said, make sure to bring your money for your yearbook, the early bird rate ends on Friday. How many of you have ever come across something in an educational environment where it's set up so that if you pay earlier, you pay less? If you've ever seen something like that, right? Now, why is that something I should notice? Why is that an equity concern? You gotta have cash flow, right? I mean, it basically guarantees that the people with the most economic resources are gonna pay the least amount for that yearbook. And the people with the least economic resources are gonna pay the biggest amount for the yearbook. Right? But how many times have all of us seen things like that and it just never occurred to us? I think it's probably occurred to those of us for whom that has been a hardship. So we actually have to learn how to recognize that stuff. We have to practice, practice recognizing it. I talk about this idea of uh, micro humiliations too, that just this everyday sort of things, not big things, but just these everyday things that might humiliate certain groups of students. You know, so think about students of color at, at your university. 
What are some of the day-to-day -day things that might happen on campus that maybe someone's not doing it in order to humiliate anybody, but still could have the impact of humiliating students of color? Can anyone think of a policy or a practice or a lack of a policy or a practice, something like that? Hmm. Not, not excluding Chief here, um, and not excluding Chief from our homecoming parade. <coughs> homecoming parade. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, I really just want to think, but they recently like, took it down, but um, a bar on campus, they had a bunch of rules, like things you could and they wear to come in, and one of them was like do rags, just like. Definitely racialized, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we gotta learn how to recognize that stuff. I often find when I ask that question around race, people struggle with it more. If I ask it around class and poverty, people can come up with examples much more quickly, like I can't afford the school swag, or I, you know, there's certain things I can't take, but, but that's, that's what I, I gotta actually practice learning how to do those uh, sorts of things, uh, recognize that stuff. So the next piece, this is just about some, some tools for helping us recognize the inequities and injustices that are operating around us. I want to talk about two conceptual tools. How am I doing on time, by the way? About 10 minutes? Uh, gosh, I learned speed reading, but I never learned speed talking, so now I'm in trouble because uh, somehow I'm about two hours behind a 40-minute uh, thing here. Interest convergence, how many of you have heard of interest convergence theory? Okay, it comes out of critical race theory, Derek Bell, you can uh, look it up. But I think it's a really important concept, so let's start with that. Interest convergence theory is basically the idea that white, white dominated institutions, institutions upholding uh, white supremacy, will sort of in, will invest in sort of racial equity or at least the illusion of that as long as movement toward racial equity, the interests of racial equity converge with the interests of the sort of white supremacy sustaining institution, right? So I will, you know, I know at, in universities, uh, uh, community colleges, high schools, wherever it is, I know that it's really popular now to have a lot of diversity and equity stuff. So I'll have some of that stuff, make sure some of that stuff is in place. But we're not gonna quite get to the part about redistributing access and opportunity. As soon as we get to that part, now the interests of racial justice diverge from the interests of white people and white dominated institutions. So that's where you see on campuses often a lot of community dialogues, you see a lot of cool programs, you see guest speakers come in and talk about race, you see all those sorts of things. But you know, when I work with institutions that want to work around racial justice, rarely is the top commitment eliminating racism. We're basically gonna leave the racism there, but then we'll plug some things in around the racism to, uh, you know, to create the illusion that we're doing something. I really encourage people to read Derek Bell. I think his first analysis around this had to do with school integration. Uh, I think a lot of, especially white liberal people, really champion that as this huge, important movement toward racial justice. But uh, uh, if you check out uh, Derek Bell's analysis of it through this interest convergence lens, it'll give you a different perspective. Uh, the second part is, uh, the second concept is this idea of disparity ideologies. This uh, looks at how people make sense out of uh, disparities in educational outcomes, things like graduation rates, grade point average, those sorts of things. Uh, what's really important about this, again, just this whole ideology part, uh, there's a study by the Department of Education that found that in high schools in the US, uh, African American students are suspended or, and expelled at much higher rates than white students. Does this come as a shock to anybody? Okay, so if we want to address this as a problem of racism, the crucial thing is understanding why this happens. Why this happens. So one of the things I've done as the beginning of a study is in my community, I went out and started interviewing white uh, parents who had kids in the local public schools. And I, 
told, you know, I shared this with them and I asked them, why do you think that happens? What do you think the most common response is? Why are African-American students suspended or expelled at higher rates? What do you think the most common response from white people is to that question? Exactly. It's like, of course, they're kicked out more. They misbehave more. Here's the problem. When people have done research to get at the bottom of that disparity, what they found is it's got nothing to do with the behaviors of students. It's got to do with the racism of teachers. It's got almost entirely to do with the racism of educators. Now, so think about this. If I see this problem and I think, well, I want to solve this problem, but I'm interpreting it as the problem here is the behavior of students, then what is my solution going to be? It's going to be about adjusting the behaviors of students, right? So that's why, what do we have in, in schools with big percentages of students of color now? We have mindfulness programs. We have social emotional learning. We have, you know, uh, uh, emotion regulation workshops. Everything that's about adjusting the cultures, the mindsets, the behaviors of students of color. And there's no way that that can work as a solution to this problem. Because none of that addresses the racism of educators, which is the source of this problem. Right? So that's why this ideological piece is very practical. If I can't answer the question, why does this happen correctly, I got no shot at coming up with a solution. So really quickly, there are sort of three popular ideological perspectives to make sense out of those kinds of disparities. The first one's called deficit ideology. Deficit ideology, our focus is on identifying the source of those uh, issues within marginalized communities. So why are parents who are experiencing poverty less likely to visit their kid's school? Oh, well, they don't value education. And, so what is our solution? Well, we convince them to value education more. Again, the problem is research shows it's got nothing to do with how they value education. First, it's got to do with do they have access to get to the school if they're working multiple jobs and don't have paid leave, right, to get paid by the hour, they don't have transportation and can't afford childcare, and also add that to how they're treated when they do go to their kid's school. Right? So if that's the problem, we got to fix those things as the problem, okay? So in order to have a deficit ideology, we have to just pretend there is no racism, there is no sexism, there is no, in this case, uh, in the case of the example I just gave, economic injustice. The second uh, disparity is called grit ideology, which in a way is a form of deficit ideology. Grit ideology is that... Uh, we recognize that there is racism, there are some structural barriers, but instead of eliminating the racism, five minutes, instead of eliminating the racism, what we focus on is, well, how do we make students of color more gritty and resilient against the racism? Now, one thing, of course, in people's own communities, I think they're probably having, how do you navigate the racist system conversation? But the racist institution, that should not be the racist institution strategy. Right? And that's, that's the problem with that. Uh, so what we want is structural ideology. Identify the racism, eliminate the racism. What are the barriers and challenges? What are the inequities, the biases, the oppressions, the injustices? That should be the first step. So if you look at it, like I think of it, why did I go backward all of a sudden? I don't know. Okay, so, so here's a higher ed example. A lot of institutions of higher ed uh, really work hard on recruiting and retaining faculty of color. But what do they do to work hard on that? So if I'm saying, okay, we're having trouble retaining faculty of color, how do I define what the problem is there? If I define it through a deficit lens, I might say, well, what we need to do is help, you know, faculty of color just have to acculturate into the institution better. So I'm just going to help them acculturate into the system better. Here's how you can fit into this racist system better. So that's kind of the deficit response. The deficit response identify the problem within faculty of color. The grit response might be a mentoring program. So I am going to assign another faculty of color to you as a new faculty of color so you can learn how to navigate and survive the racist system. Of course, part of the problem with this is now you know, you have this extra invisible service that faculty of color are doing, 
uh, to provide support that people shouldn't really need because they shouldn't have to survive the system, right? Structural response, eliminate the racism faculty of color experience. I've been doing this work for 25 years all over the country. I've worked in pro with probably 100 universities. I have not found one whose strategy for retaining faculty of color is to eliminate the racism. <laughs> and there is no other solution to this. That's the only thing that will work in the long term. But who's using that as a solution? Okay, so I am way behind here, so I'm gonna, this is all really important. Are you getting this? Because this is important stuff. <laughs> I just wanna jump to, uh, why did I think I could do all this? I, okay, I did, I'm just gonna finish really quickly by talking about these. So I talk about some basic principles of equity literacy, basic principles to guide equity and justice work in education. The first one is the direct confrontation principle. Identify the injustice, eliminate the injustice. Anything we're doing that's getting us off track, celebrating diversity, it's not that it's not important, uh, but the path to equity requires direct confrontations with inequity. How is racism operating here right now? How am I naming that and how am I addressing that directly? How am I addressing that directly? The second one is prioritization principle. That we have to reimagine policy and practices not in ways that create equality, but in ways that actively prioritize the interests of people whose interests historically have never been prioritized. That's how you get to anti-racism. In a context of racial inequity, equality just reproduces inequity. So you actually have to actively prioritize the people who have been cheated out of access and opportunity for generations. Uh, I talked about that already. Fix injustice, not kids principle. That's that deficit ideology piece. If any part of our equity work is going into adjusting the mindsets, the cultures, the values of people who are marginalized, then we're actually recreating the marginalization. So fix injustice, not people who are marginalized. Well, that's good timing. My clicker doesn't work anymore. Okay. So, um, oh, this is the end anyway. So I'm just going to end with this Martin Luther King Jr. quote. I'm exploiting the labors of an African-American man here at the end of my uh, uh, workshop. He says, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the stumbling block is not the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who's more devoted to order than to justice. Here's the piece that pops out who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. At whose pace are we moving here? If we're moving at the pace of the people with the least interest in the movement, then we're doing it backward. Oh. This thing keeps popping up on my screen. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. So it takes more than goodwill. It takes goodwill plus deep understanding, how does racism operate, plus the willingness not just to think about it, but to act on it. And if institutions could uh, get behind that, I think we'd be in a better place. So my time is up. Thank you. Thank you.